Mahi sir. Yes. Can we start? Yes, we can start. Yeah. Very good morning to all of you. Very good morning. And this, uh, with a warm welcome, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of Sun Pharma for today's webinar on live temporal bone dissection course. Actually, we have two sessions on this, and we have great personalities today. And I'm very, very I'm very much privileged to invite Dr. Professor Mohan Kameshwaran up to this uh, webinar. Sir, please do come, sir. I mean, my heartiest welcome to you. And we have with us Dr. Vijay Krishnan, uh, where I mean, then is he is well known now because uh, we uh, we have been conducting a lot of webinars, and he is uh, key instrumental in today's webinar as well. As I requested him, Dr. Vijay Krishnan is HOD Department of Snoring and Sleep Disorders at Madras ENT Research Foundation, Chennai. Who is the founder secretary of Indian Association of Surgeons for Sleep Apnea and Indian Academy of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery? His special interest is neurotology and sleep disorders breathing. And he has been invited as a faculty in several national and international conferences to his credit. Actually, I was sharing with Dr. Vijay Krishnan one photo of uh, uh, the, the recent government um, stand in the entire South India, actually in Madurai. They opened the first time that the sleep apnea department, and I was sharing with him about this photo and the department's uh, the beginning, and I think it is a good beginning for that particular uh, field where a lot of awareness is coming, and definitely I am very sure that Dr. Vijay Krishna has played a vital role in in making that in awareness on this particular field. Uh, so before I hand over the session to you, I request uh, Mr. Ambrish uh, to say a few words. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Berman. Uh, indeed, a matter of great pride uh, that personalities like uh, Dr. Mohan Kamishwaran, Dr. Vijay Krishnan, uh, and today Dr. Raghu is associated with Sun Pharma today. Uh, as you all know that Sun Pharma always promoted these scientific contents, whether related to ENT or any other uh, disease. In fact, being the number one domestic and the fourth largest uh, global company, we understand fully the need for patients' welfare and we maintain uninterrupted supply chain. And across uh, <clears throat> all the locations, whether it's the uh, most remote place in India or across the uh, globe, our uh, full supply chain is uh, always maintained, as a result of which now the patient suffers uh, because of uh, not getting a medicine. Uh, Pharmagear is a division of Sun Pharma which remains 100% dedicated for ENT and uh, we promise that our uh, uninterrupted support will be there, will continue for uh, ENT scientific uh, webinars or scientific discussions in future as well. So with our, uh, without further ado, I would now like to kick start our webinar and with this I hand over the session to uh, Dr. Vijay Kishnan. So over to you, Dr. Vijay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, welcome you all to this uh, live temporal bone dissection course, chapter one, uh, which is going to be on basics of uh, autology surgery. At the outset, I would like to thank Sun Pharma, Pharma Care Division, and his uh, entire team for making this possible. And would like to thank Professor Mohan Commission sir also, and the MERV team for making this arrangement. Before going into the course, Dear delegates, this video is transmitted in a HD uh, quality, so please have a good internet connection and use uninterrupted Wi-Fi for smooth video and be closer to the router. And if the page uh, is hanging, uh, just refresh the page, that may be because of your internet connection problem. So this made available in our MERF workshop YouTube channel, so you can watch it later, so you no need to record the session. Please do subscribe to that YouTube channel so that you will get regular updates about the videos. The link will be sent to you at email. Please type in your question in the box given in the web page. It will be answered shortly. And please feel free to ask any questions. So if you want to send your query by voice message, send it to my WhatsApp number 988-4696362. And e-certificate will be provided at the end of the session. So once the session is over, please reload or refresh the page. The link will be activated to enter the details to receive the certificate to an email ID. Please don't resubmit. 
please check your email inbox or spam folder you would have received the certificate so coming to the topic per se understanding the anatomy of the temporal bone is the basis of any otology surgery and dissection is the way to master it so why we do this workshop what is so interesting in it because temporal bone is one of the bone extremely interesting bone in the body which holds vital structures in it which makes adds challenge to the surgery and to the surgeon so no other bone in the body has a workshop like this this course is designed Supposing? with a beginner yes uh, no voice is coming i believe when I mean, people are talking let no voice is coming i think you need to start a little again you um, need to check desktop audio has to be on anubhav Can you hear me now? I think we could hear. Yeah. No, no. Can you hear? Oh. Oh. Mr. Ranji. Ranji, can you check? I think uh, in the live it is coming. No issues. Okay. On no, the I live could, it is coming. I could hear you because actually then people were talking about that on the live only. Yeah. One minute. Yeah, Manoj. In the no, so live, no it audio. is coming. No audio. No audio. Huh? Which link? Wait, wait. Next, okay. Live we are talking there. Manoj, man, can you hear me? In the in the live, can you hear me in the live, Manoj? It is coming in the live. I could hear the audio. Yeah, yeah. Now it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. Can you please start once again, sir? Yeah. Welcome you all to this live temporal bone dissection course, chapter one, um, which is going to be on basics. At the outset, I would like to thank Sun Pharma Pharma Care Division and the entire team for making this possible, and would like to thank Professor Moon Commission Sir and the MOF team. for making this arrangement before going into the course for say dear delegates this video is transmitted in hd quality so please have a good internet connection and use uninterrupted wifi for smooth video and try to be closer to the router if it hangs or gets stuck just refresh the page it will play this course will be made available in our mouth workshop youtube channel so you can watch it later so no need to record this session please do subscribe to the youtube channel and get the updates link will be sent to your email please type in your question in the box given below will be answered shortly please feel free to ask any question if you want to send your query by voice message send it to my whatsapp number 9884696362 e certificate will be provided at the end of the session once the session is over please reload or refresh the page the link will be activated to enter the details to receive the certificate to your email id please don't resubmit please check your email inbox or spam folder you have received the certificate okay so to the topic understanding the anatomy of the temporal bone is the basis of any otology surgery and dissection is the way to master it so why we do this workshop what is so interesting in it because the temporal bone is one of the bone interesting bone in the body which hosts vital structures which adds challenge to the surgeon no other bone in the body has a workshop like this this course is designed with the beginner in mind and will be a guide to intricate anatomy of the temporal bone every bone is like a fingerprint and it is different which hosts lot of surprise for you when you dissect In this course we will be demonstrating basic and advanced surgical procedures in two series. So today we will be demonstrating the setup how we do what uh, what's the instruments needed how the microscope is being set up and minor procedures like mirroring anatomy with the grow mat on T tube 
and uh, flap elevation techniques and uh, stepidotomy, simple mastoidectomy, posterior tympanotomy, and facial nerve decompression, etc., will be demonstrated. Join with us on next Sunday, 23rd August, for Chapter 2 at 10 a.m. So before going into the dissection, it is my great privilege to introduce our moderator, um, our speaker, Professor Mohan Kamishan, sir, who is the Chief ENT Surgeon, Director of Madras ENT Research Foundation, Chennai, who is a and neurotologist, who does production in this country, who is the recipient of Bhatma Shri National Award and prestigious Dr. B.C. Roy Award, and many more to his credit. So without wasting further time, I would request Professor Mohan, sir, to take over over to you, sir. Thank Can you. you switch over to microscopic image? Yeah. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you so much for those very kind words. And first of all, let me thank Sun Pharma for this wonderful uh, support. I think they've been doing a tremendous uh, job. I, I, they told me a little earlier, they've done something like 4,800 uh, webinars in this 100 days. I mean, that must be some kind of a world record, I think. You know, it's an amazing uh, uh, commitment from the, from the com company to academia. And I, I'm so grateful for them uh, for doing this. I think, uh, you know, they really deserve a pat on the back. Uh, kudos to you all. Uh, you know, this is where I always say uh, the difference between uh, uh, a pharma company, which is, uh, you know, uh, really a, 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 an institution and an industry is the academic commitment. So you have shown yourself to be an institution, not just an industry. So I think uh, you know you deserve a pat on the back for this, and this team is really a A team. So thank you all for that, and thanks again, Vijay, for uh, for you know for uh, dragging me very reluctantly to do this. Uh, you know, so I, I think uh, my my problem is that I can never say no to Vijay, and of course the Sun Farm also. So you know it's a. Uh, uh, basically, I've been cornered to do this, uh, but anyway, it's a pleasure. I mean, I must admit, it's always a pleasure to be dissecting. He, he said that I'm going to be a speaker. I'm not going to be a speaker, but I'm going to speak very little, uh, hopefully. You know, I'm going to be showing more so that you all uh, get the benefit of uh, you know, demonstration. Today, this uh, workshop is really designed with, you know, the very basic uh, procedures. So, it is for the beginner. So I must apologize at the very beginning to uh, with the real experts who are all going to be here. I mean, it's not going to be uh, designed for you. This is uh, a very basic uh, module. Uh, next Sunday, we will be going into more advanced work, I suppose. But uh, the idea is that, you know, everybody should have a, a clear understanding of autology and, and how to do it. Now, uh, one disclaimer at the very beginning, this is all going to be microscopic. I am not going to be showing en endoscopic uh, techniques, uh, uh, partly because I don't know also, you know. So, uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I am an old dog and I have stuck to microscope all these years. So, that is what I am going to be uh, showing mostly today. Um, the second thing I, I want to emphasize today is, is what Vijay touched upon, you know, the, about the temporal bone. There's, there's no doubt in my mind, this is the most beautiful bone in the body. I, and I'm not saying it simply because, you know, I'm an autologist, but, uh, you know, there's no bone in the body which, which has more intricate anatomy than the temporal bone. It's a, it's a wonderful structure which has, uh, you know, nerves in it, it's got uh, arteries, it's got veins, uh, it's got uh, uh, very important organs of balance and hearing all you know into a compress into that little small little bone on the side of the head and this bone if you can understand believe me you know you, you are really uh, someone because I, I i can tell you in 45 years of dissecting the bone i am still not too sure about this bone uh, every time i think i know this bone a, a surprise will come up you know, it will uh, throw a googly and I am I'm, uh, stuck uh, wondering what is happening. So, it is a, it's a bone which will never cease to surprise you or amaze you and for that reason, you know, it is also one of the most challenging. good romance or good wine, 
uh, you know, your relationship with temple bone only gets better and better the more you get to know it. So, it is an amazing bone. Uh, so, let us start off initially with uh, very simple procedures, probably the most common procedures on the temple bone, uh, which will be meningotomy. Uh, and then after that, we will proceed on to uh, the middle ear. Uh, and then we will go on to the, the bone per se. So, let us uh, go step by step. So, the first uh, procedure that I am going to be showing to you is uh, meringotomy, which of course, needless to say is one of the commonest surgical procedures done in the world anywhere. So, it is uh, particularly in, in children, it's, it is the commonest procedure performed. So, basically meringotomy uh, will be the first demonstration. Okay. So, now uh, this is a very good temple bone that I have been able to get and I have to thank one of my fellows for it, uh, Dr. Manjunath, who was very kindly you know gave me this uh, bone. Now, you can see here the entire uh, tympanic membrane nicely demonstrated, you know that is the superior uh, quadrant here, that is the inferior quadrant 6 o'clock, anterior and posterior and this is the right temporal bone. The right temporal bone because you know the bone is kept in the surgical position. This is the first thing that the dissector has to get to know. You have to keep it in the surgical position which means basically you have to imagine that it is on a patient who is lying on a table ready for surgery. And in surg surgical position, the uh, root of zygoma is seen anteriorly going forwards and we can see the mastoid tip going to the right. So, therefore, this is the right temporal bone. So, that is how you demonstrate the side of the bone. So, now let us go on to the, the procedure per se. Now, you can actually th see the cone of light there, uh, if you look carefully, that is the antero inferior quadrant and you can see the cone of light very nicely. So, the idea is that you want to make a, an incision in the antero inferior quadrant. So, this is where you are going to be making the incision. So, let us start off, I am using a sickle knife or you can use also a, a meringotomy knife if you want to use that. Okay. So, that is how you do that, after which you have a fine suction please. You are going to have in a, in a patient with uh, effusion, you are going to be having fluid coming out. So, what you are going to be doing is to use a fine sucker and then uh, you know suck out the, the fluid through the incision that you made. So, that is how we are going to be doing that. Now, sometimes with very thick uh, glue, glue like uh, effusion, you know, very thick fluid, it may not come out. So, you may have to uh, use a bigger sucker or the other option that you have is that you may have to make a, a counter incision. The counter incision is usually made you know more inferiorly here in this part, so that you allow the uh, suction to come when you suck out the fluid, the counter incision will allow some air to go in and help you to suck out the thick fluid. So, that is the trick that you may have to do if the fluid is very, very thick. Now, some people uh, you know uh, use uh, a little bit of fluid to flush into the middle ear. I would not recommend that you know because uh, you know some people actually use a, a syringe, give me a syringe please, a syringe to actually you know go inside like this and then flush into the fluid. You know, that is not a good practice. I have actually seen once uh, very early in my days when I was in UK. I have seen a child who had this kind of a thing done, you know, developing meningitis postoperatively. So, sometimes you must not forget that the, the bone uh, may be dehiscent and you may be actually causing a breach in the dura even. So, do not do not use force and suck it out. So, you just use suction gently if you want you can make a compensation. So, once you have done that then the grommet uh, will have to be placed in position. Now, different types of grommets are there. Um, you know, uh, the Shah grommet, the shepherd grommet, so on. So, you can all uh, check it out. Uh, I mean, I, I, I am quite happy with this uh, grommet that we have been using now. Let me just show it to you because you can have other sizes and pediatric sizes and different types of materials, you know. So, this is uh, Teflon, but you can also have titanium and so on. So, it is up to you. Now, the idea is it is like putting a button, you know, that is how you do it. So, you have the flange go into the incision and then uh, use the needle or uh, any instrument to just gently use pressure, so that it slips into the, uh, the incision that you made very comfortably like a, like a button. So, just uh, allow it to settle in like this. 
So, this is the uh, grommet being introduced. Now, many, many years ago when I was uh, just starting my uh, training in UK, one of the first posting that I had was where I was very lucky. I was uh, posted uh, in uh, Royal National Throat Nose and Ear Hospital as a, uh, a junior registrar under uh, no less a gentleman than Dr. Shah himself, who, who you know, who designed the, the grommet, the Shah grommet, which you're all familiar with. And Dr. Shah was, was, a, was a master craftsman, you know, in, in otology. And he t told me one thing, he, I'll never forget that. He said, the sign of a good surgeon when he's doing myringotomy is that he should not see an RBC in the canal. In other words, there should be absolutely no bleeding in the canal. I mean, here I can't take credit, you know, in a full bone, but in a patient, if you are doing the procedure, there should be no bleeding at all. Only then have you really shown yourself to be a master. So that's the yardstick. I mean, it's a very difficult yardstick, obviously, but that's the yardstick which you have to set for yourself when you're doing the procedure. Now, the next pro next uh, thing I'm going to show you is to use a Montgomery T tube. Uh, now, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, uh, a Goody T tube. Mm -hmm. Goody T tube. Not Montgomery. That's for the tricky. The Goody T tube. The the T tube is used when you want to have a long stay grommet. Now this happens, you know, when you usually don't like to do it the very first occasion, but if you have a very atelectatic tympanic membrane where you don't have much middle ear space, then a, then a T tube may have to be used. Also, if you have been doing two or three myringotomies and grommets and it still keeps recurring, then a T tube may have to be kept in. But remember, a T tube causes a lot more scarring of the drum more of sclerosis long term and even sometimes persistent perforation. So, a T-tube decision for T-tube is not to be taken lightly, it has to be taken with after a lot of consideration and you have to be pretty sure that it's absolutely essential before you do that. So, I'm just taking out the grommet now, okay. So, now the, for a T-tube, let me show you the T-tube first of all, with, uh, some of you will be familiar, some of you may not. Now, that's a T-tube, that's a, a goody T-tube, it looks like the letter T like this and then these two flanges go into the middle ear and the tube itself you can see is has been cut short actually my nurse has cut it short it's much longer but I always like to cut it short because it's too long sometimes and if it's too long it comes right up to the external canal and can be irritating so the way to do it is to keep the two flanges together and hold it like this okay so, the two flanges have to be together, okay, and then you have to introduce it into the middle ear through the incision that you made, sorry, It's a bit tricky that you know, but you have to negotiate it in. And once you have gone in, can you do please? Can you do? Fix the tube with your needle and then release your forceps. Okay, that is it. The T tube will open itself, the flange will open. Now take a pick, get me a pick, adjust it so that it is not hitching against any of the walls, like so. So that is a T tube in position. So this is how you put a T tube and make sure that it is staying in position. All right. So now the next uh, procedure that I'm going to be doing is going to be a, a stepidotomy. Now let me tell you, this is one of the most uh, interesting surgeries in the temporal bone. Uh, historically, you know, it is an amazing procedure because there's a lot of history to it. Now, in the turn of the century, you know, uh, somewhere in the uh, almost a, a good uh, nearly a hundred years ago, not not quite hundred, but almost there. Uh, in uh, th there is this uh, very famous uh, surgeon uh, in New York called Samuel Rosen. 
Now, Rosen, uh, you know, had been uh, intrigued by autosclerosis, by a fixed APs, and you know, had been thinking about methods of how to deal with the problem and so on. Before that, of course, you know, a lot of surgeons had done wonderful work, uh, notably Politza himself, who had done a lot of work on dissections on the temporal bone and particularly in autosclerotic and realized that the fixation of the stapes was the most common uh, finding and also was the, the main finding and the cause of the conductive hearing loss. So, uh, Samuel Rosen uh, was one of those uh, young surgeons who had been all uh, you know, thinking about what should be, should be done about it. You must remember that this was the pre-antibiotic era and there was this mental block of most surgeons had this fear of opening into the vestibule because that was a, a direct route uh, which might uh, endanger the patient, you know, give rise to uh, meningitis. So, the risk of infection was always in the forefront of the, the patient uh, or the, of the surgeon's mind. So, they were all worried about what should be done, you know, should we, uh, you know, open, should not open, how do we do it, what about the risk uh, to the patient and so on. So, this was the situation. What happened was one, an act of serendipity, you know, an accident, which is a lucky accident. Rosen was actually, uh, you know, looking at the middle ear of a patient with autosclerosis. <coughs> so, he had done a tympanotomy and he was uh, watching the incrocipular joint, keeping an instrument there, gently pressing it and so on, when accidentally his nurse knocked his hand. And, uh, you know, when she hit the hand, the hand went and hit the, the instrument, the, which uh, the hand went and hit the incredibular joint and the step is accidentally mobilized. The patient immediately said on the table, he was on local analysis, he said, immediately he said, oh, I can hear now, you know. So, you know, this is a dramatic moment, a moment of realization, you know, that you could mobilize the step is. And the moment you mobilize the step is, you know, the patient could start hearing. So, Samuel Rosen then, you know, did this on a few more patients and then, you know, he started talking about it and publishing it and it was uh, uh, one of the most dramatic events uh, in autology. In fact, it is the only occasion that an autological surgical procedure hit the headlines of New York Times. So, New York Times carried a, uh, a caption, the headline was, New York Surgeon restores hearing for deaf patients, now, that is the uh, heading. And next day, he said that Samuel Rosen drove uh, to his, uh, from his apartment, from his house to the, uh, to his chambers in his clinic. And, uh, he, you know, the whole street was blocked off, it was full of people. There were mounted police, police on horses, uh, trying to organize the crowd and so on and so forth. Samuel Rosen got worried, he said, you know, maybe somebody has burgled into his, his clinic or some damage has happened. <coughs> so, he uh, got down and uh, went to the police officer and then asked him, uh, you know, what happened, what, what's the problem? Then the, the police officer said, oh, you know, this is mad uh, uh, New York doctor who claims to cure hearing. And all these people are people who have got a hearing problem, they are deaf people, they have come here to get their hearing sorted out. So, Samuel Rosen told the police officers, I am that mad man, you know, so can you please escort me to my clinic. So, that is that's how he went to his clinic and that the rest of it is history. Now, Samuel Rosen then actually went round the world, you know, he even came to India, he went everywhere to China, to India, everywhere, taught people how to do a state mobilization. Now, what happened was, in a few months time, a lot of these patients are coming back with recurrence of their hearing problem and that is when Samuel Rosen realized that this is not going to work because mobilization may lead to temporary improvement in hearing, but eventually it will again refix and they will have a hearing loss. So, long term it does not work. So, to his credit, this, this is where you should know that he is a great man. He wrote to every surgeon that he had trained in the world saying that I am very sorry, I apologize, I taught you a wrong operation. So, please, uh, you know, the, don't do this procedure because it is not going to give long term benefits. So, that such was his intellectual honesty. So, basically, you know, so then came Shea and, uh, you know, Shuknek and, and other surgeons who then modified this into a, a stepidectomy procedure and, uh, you know, started using various uh, processes for reconstruction. 
also uh, later on you know uh, uh, the, the, the era of a small fenestrum stepidotomy uh, came in and, uh, and the rest of it you all know. So, now let us go on to the actual uh, steps of the procedure, but I must tell you you know that a stepidectomy is uh, very difficult to learn on a cadaver. Uh, various reasons you know uh, it is a uh, uh, I will keep telling you as you go, but it is uh, always much more frustrating in a temporal bone than in an actual patient. So, let us start off. Now, the first thing to do is the incision and the incision still carries uh, Rosen's name. Uh, the Rosen's incision uh, it starts off from uh, sir, uh, sir yeah. there are a couple of questions. Yeah. Can I interpret sir? Yeah, please. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar from Kanpur, uh, he has asked, can this grommets uh, be reshaped and used in type 3 tympanoplasty? Can grommets be used in tympanoplasty? Ah, yes sir, yeah, yeah, type 3. That yeah, is an interesting question. Yeah. You know, one of the things you can do is you can use a, a, a reshaped grommet to fill in the gap between a, 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 a incus uh, uh, the process and the stapes. So, sometimes there is a small necrosis of the the process the tip, then the gap can be fitted in between uh, incus and the stapes and you can use the uh, a grommet. Now, I personally used to do it initially, but I have not given up because the long term results are not very reliable. So, I have now started using of course, the reshaping of the uh, incus repositioning and I think it is more, much more reliable in the long run. But yes, to answer your question, the answer is yes, you can put in an incus to interpose between the uh, partially closed lenticular process and the head of the shape. Okay. Uh, so, one more, uh, Dr. Jayanta from Kolkata, uh, how long does the T tube stay inside? Can be removed? Yeah, T tube normally will stay at least for uh, a year or two. If the longest I have had is for a patient for almost about 5 years. Invariably, the reason why you will have to take it out is because of secondary infection. Sometimes, you know, it gets infected, uh, you have uh, fungal infection, so on. So, then you have to take out the T tube. So, generally speaking, it will not come out. It will never come out. It will only be removed because of infection. So, that is the normal course of events. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Right. So, let us start off now with incision. The incision is, at, you know, this is the roughly the side of the annulus. So, it has to be away as far away from the annulus beyond the bony cartilaginous junction. So, this is a bony cartilaginous junction here. So, let us go a little further away and it starts uh, from you know 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock and then on to 12 o'clock and it will beyond 12 o'clock. So, let us start off there and the, the it is like a parabola. So, the, the maximum point of excursion from the uh, annulus is in 9 o'clock position. In other words, at 9 o'clock position comes away from the annulus to the maximum extent. At 6 o'clock and 12 and 1 o'clock, it goes towards the annulus. So, it is like a an apron, it is like a parabola and that is how the incision is made. And the incision is made with a knife which is and the pressure is on the bone, you know, go right up to the bone. So, do not be hesitant about that make the incision all the way down and here as well coming as so far away from the annulus is here at 9 o'clock and then going of course to 12 o'clock and even beyond 12 o'clock ok. Now, then once the incision is made then it is the, the you can see this is a, a, a slotted Rosen's knife and you use the knife like a you know uh, like a knife you use it with pressure on the bone. So, your pressure should not be on the on the skin, it should be on the bone and you must be elevating the flap from all points you know at the same time. Never go in one area for a long time and then come to the other area. Do them all simultaneously, slowly take your time you know and if you have bleeding you just use uh, suction there. You can use a little bit of cotton wool also if you want to lift it up and when you reach the upper part of the incision, you can actually extend the incision a little bit more if you want using a pair of scissors there because superiorly the skin is quite thick and it will lend itself to usage of a scissor if you want. Normally, it is much easier than this, but because it is formalized, it is more difficult. But you can 
see it is coming up slowly. Take your time, do not be in a hurry. Scissors. So, just lift it up gently. Scissors, please. That look, huh? well, this is a good idea. Are aromatic scissors. Carelia. <sighs> Very thick skin, that's why it's not getting. Okay, got iris scissors. This part of the skin is very thick, you know, so that's why you sir, can use this. Could you please little center it, sir? Okay. Not center, no, sorry. Is it better? Is it better? So, the incision has to go beyond 12 o'clock, then you have a much better access because this is the area that you are interested in the post superior part. So, always go a little further beyond 12 o'clock that way things become easier. So, now we have lifted up the flap from all around circumferentially and as I told you go everywhere at the same time, lift up from different parts at the same time. Do not go in one place for you know and then go to the other place and so on. Simultaneously lift up from all the quadrants. Lift it up slowly till you reach the annulus. Now, we are reaching the annulus now. In fact, the way you know that is because you feel a slight give in your bone with your instrument. Okay. You, need, you can feel that small give there. You can also see the annulus in the patient usually. You can see it as a whitish cord. Right. Once you have reached that point, now use a sickle knife. You can also use a pick to lift up the annulus from the sulcus. Right, now, we can see the annulus there and you can even see the cord also there. Actually. Now, in a patient, it will come out very easily, but in a formalized specimen, it can be quite uh, difficult because it tends to fall back. So, here I have lifted it off. Now, that is the lateral process of the malleus, that is what you want to see. And then you see the posterior malleolar ligament here. Now, the posterior malleolar ligament has to be cut, sharp, sharp instrument, and just below that you have the cord. There, you see the corda now. 
Now the corda should be preserved as far as possible. And to do that, you can gently push it, but don't stretch it too much. Okay? So gently push it out of the way, but don't stretch it too much because that can give rise to this juicy or altered taste. Again, this is easier in a patient than in a cadaver. Now let's have a, a skeet. If it's not, if it's very high insertion of the of the corda, then of course you know if there's a risk that it is going to be stretched beyond a point, then some surgeons actually cut it rather than to stretch it. But you know, preferably keep it as far as you can. Now the the posterior superior area is where you are interested, and here you have to use a curette or a micro drill. I generally like to use a micro drill, a skeeter drill, but here let us use a, a curette and always take it out not in big chunks but in small peels like a peel of an onion. Take it slowly, take it, take your time. Use the side of the curette, never the tip of the curette. Always use the side of the curette and take it out layer by layer from inside out. There are some surgeons who, who always say that you have to always come from superior to inferior and so on. There's nothing like that, you know, whichever is convenient. You know, remember pronation is always a much stronger movement than supination. So, you know, you can always uh, do the way you want. But always small bits and using the side of the instrument. In fact, you know, curate is one instrument you should never discard because the more it, it gets chipped, the more it is broken, the older it is, the better it works actually. You know. So, it is one of those uh, peculiar instruments which you know you should keep it for, for many years. So nicely cured, you know, get create yourself enough space. You should not hesitate to take out bone here because the more you expose, the easier it is for you later on. Of course, if you have a micro drill, it makes this job easier, much easier for you. small pick please. Now you can see there is a lot of mucosal folds inside in this patient. The middle ear has been having some previous inflammation. So you can see a lot of mucosal folds there. 
So I'm just breaking those folds. Can I have a fine section, please? And you can straight away see the tendon of the stapedius here. That is the tendon of the stapedius. Bit of annulus here. Let us get it out of the way. Sickle good. This is the problem of a formalized drum, always stiff. Curate. This will interfere with your feel later if you do not clean it up. Okay. So, now you can see a few things, you can see the tendon obviously, but let us look a little beyond that. Give me a peek. You can see the tendon here, small peak mark, and you can also see just manage to see the tip of the pyramid that is the tip of the pyramid here. I can feel bone there. So, the pyramid tip and the tendon coming on that is the idle view. Here is the horizontal part of the facial nerve there. It is a bit of mucosa on it, but that is the horizontal part of the facial nerve. So, let us divide, I mean clean out this mucosal folds there in the whole window area. That is the oval window there and foot plate there. This is the posterior crust of the stapes. Okay. So, there is a posterior crust of the stapes. Right. Now, there are different options for you now at this point of time. So, my own preference, I will just tell you what I do is I first of all at this is Keter counter. At this point of time, I would like to do a small fenestrum in the foot plate. So, for that I normally would like to use a, a micro drill, but uh, here I am just using a, a perforator. So, you can use different sizes perforator you know normally you want to have uh, the piston I like to use is a 0 0.6 millimeter piston. So, at least a 0 0.8 millimeter uh, opening is what you want to create. So, I have just made a small opening or uh, what I would call a control fenestrum okay, in the posterior third of the foot plate, <coughs> the posterior third of the foot plate. So, now at this point of time you have the options of uh, you know going ahead doing a, 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 a stepidotomy, I mean you are putting in a piston and then taking out the superstructure preserving the tendon you know so many things. So, you do so or you can use a laser even for the making the fenestrum and preserve the tendon or cut the tendon. So, whichever you want, but let me show you a simple easy way of doing it then uh, you can you know always improvise on it. Now, uh, the thing to do now at this stage is to thin out the posterior crust. So, this uh, you know you can do with uh, a micro drill if you have it. If you do not have a micro drill give me a, a, a the, the uh, sickle please. This is the posterior crust here, so you want to make it thinner. Pick. Okay, so I have just 
partially fractured the posterior crust here. And then <coughs> you can, if uh, I am going to remove the tendon, I am going to cut the tendon, this is the time to do it. So, use a pair of fine scissors to cut the tendon, sharp scissors, okay, cut the tendon now. And then by a bucket handle movement of the stapes, you can actually fracture the crust because the anterior crust is very, very thin. So, it will just fracture easily. The posterior crust is thick. We have already thinned it out or partially fractured it. So, if you keep your pick just below the head in the neck and move it down, the whole superstructure will fracture like a bucket handle movement. So, I have removed the superstructure now. You can also do this at the end after putting your piston because some people like to do that, you know, because you, when you have superstructure, it steadies the incus. So, but you know, your space is more when you remove the superstructure. So, now at this point, enlarge the fenestrum. So, give me the perforator again, a small pick maybe. Um, sir? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Daniel Rajan from Trivandrum is asking, uh, what is the size of the micro drill bit size for two yeah, rod? 0.8 is what I normally use because you want to have a 0.6 piston, you know, I am using a 0.6 piston. So, for two rod only? For two rod also, it is the same, yeah, exactly same. same. You do not have to right. be changing your drill every time. And Dr. Aishwarya from Bangalore, she is yeah. asking, what is the combination of local anesthetics used for oh, your yeah, ear surgery? Excellent. So, I normally give a pre-medication with uh, pethidine, uh, you know, 100 milligrams usually in a normal size adult with uh, 25 milligrams of phenergan. Uh, this is given about for, uh, 45 minutes prior, prior to surgery. Then uh, local anesthetic, I like to give plain xylocaine, uh, 2 percent with 1 in 200,000 adrenaline, which is pre-prepared solution. And the, the, in, 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 uh, the infiltration is given in the posterior superior quadrant here, okay, till you, you know, infiltrate here and the posterior inferior quadrant also. And of course, on the ear lobule because I like to take some fat from the ear lobule for sealing. Okay. So, now. And, and uh, so, uh, Dr. Rahija from Saharanpur is also asking what, what is the analysis you preferred for meringotomy? Is it same? For meringotomy, exactly same, yeah. exact same. Two persons allocane. Two persons allocane will act for about almost two hours, you know. So you can comfortably use it for all these procedures. Some people add sensor cane, but I think it's not really required because you know xylocaine is more than adequate time for these procedures. Uh, now let's have the piston, please. Now the next thing to do is to measure the 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 length between the of the piston that you're going to be using, and for that you can use a measuring rod, which you see here. You keep the tip of it on the foot plate and you can see here, you know, 3.5, 4, 4.25, so it's going to be 4.25. Usually you see the point, this is a middle point which is sticking to the incus, add about 0.25 to that, so 4.25. And that's about the average. Most of the middle layers, I mean the piston sizes in India would be from 4.25 to 4.5, usually 4.25. Now, you know, it is very difficult, uh, luckily here, you know, we were able to fracture, but in a normal temp uh, temple bone anatomy, the stapes is mobile. So, it is very difficult to actually, you know, keep the foot plate there and actually fracture. So, a lot of people get frustrated, but the point is do not get frustrated if you cannot do a stapedotomy in a temple bone. It is very, very, very challenging, much more than a patient process. So, after I have measured it, now I have this piston, which is a, a Teflon piston. Let me go down to low magnification. And you can see the graduations here, 3.255, 5, 3.75, 4, 4.25. We wanted a 4.25, right? So, let us use a 4.25 slot here. Oh, sorry.
4.25 okay so that's 4.25 there so we have put it in now once you have done that the reverse is where you're sticking out is that's the extra length so use a sharp knife a, a 15 blade and then shave off that the sharp cut okay it should be it should be absolutely flat and there should be nothing sticking out and it should be a flat surface now once you have done that now you have to open out the loop of the piston so i'm just using a teflon piston which is the commonest piston most people use because you have different you know pistons once you become an expert you can start using more advanced pistons but uh, frankly teflon piston is is really stood the test of time i mean i've been doing separate me from i think from somewhere around 19 maybe 1980 or so, uh, from 80 till now, about 40 years of stepidotomies, and I have only used Teflon piston mostly, and 90, 90%, 95%, I would say. You know. So, to open the loop, you know, you just have to thread it through the loop and get an instrument like a, like a, a probe, for example, and gradually push it up so it will open up, okay, as it gets thicker and thicker, the stem gets thicker and thicker, the loop will open more and more. You have to nicely open it, you know, you have to break that spring so it nicely opens up. But you know, Teflon has a memory, it will quickly close up. Uh, so, Dr. Gandhi from Tirichi uh, he is asking, if laser is to be used to make the fenestrum, what should be the settings and uh, yeah, any possibility of overheating? It depends on the, if you're using a CO2 laser, use a CO2 laser. The setting must be very, very low, you know, keep it at very low setting and then the idea is that you use, you just, uh, you know, uh, thin out the foot plate with the, with the uh, laser and then usually one or two milliamps will be what you need and then you can use a, uh, an instrument like a small pick to take out the SR and it will open up. So this is the, uh, okay, this is the uh, loop opened out. Okay, hold the instrument along the long axis, slight inclination, okay, along the long, long axis of the instrument. Now, once you have done that, okay, you have a good view of the incus and the fenestra. So, you should go parallel to the incus, like so. First, go with your fenestra into, I mean, your, your long axis into the fenestra and then twist it 90 degrees till it slots into the incus and then release your instrument. So, you go parallel, give me horses again, I will repeat that movement. It should all be in one movement, okay. You go parallel to the incus, the, the loop must be parallel to the incus, go in with the long process into the fenestrum and then you know you turn it 90 degrees so it slots into the incus like this and you open up okay now you can make final adjustments with the pick if it's not sitting very well like now use the pick but always keep it at the point where the c meets the stem okay there at that junction and then give a gentle push and it will lock into position like this okay and then before you do anything else, it's a good practice to crimp the instrument gently. Don't overdo it. You know, just gently push it. Give me a pick, please. So whenever you want to make adjustments, that's how you do it. Uh, sir, Dr. N. N. K. Raju from Kakinada, who is asking in accidental damage or dislocation of incus, how to put or apply the piston? Right. First of all, you should try your best to avoid it. It's the worst uh, accident that can happen and it's not a small problem, it's a big problem. If that happens, you know, then you have to have two hand technique, give me a pick. And with one hand, you have to steady the incus like this. Keep it steady with the pick and then with the other hand, you have to go and put the piston and then remove this. It's much, much more difficult. So, you know, try your best to avoid it. Small pick. 
pick. So once you have done this and everything is in position now, you know, so you can then do your hanging test. Okay? This is the hanging test. Just make sure it is in position. Okay? Right. Do not be over enthusiastic and do not try for a round window reflex. Do not. Do not do that, please. Because, you know, first of all, it is not watertight, your, your piston. So, getting it through is difficult and you are creating a lot of trauma to the cochlea if you are doing it. So, please do not do that. So, once you have done that, then of course, you know, you have a bit of fat, you harvest from the lobule and then once you have done that, uh, you know, you can uh, reposition your corda and then your membrane goes back into its normal position, okay. This is how you do a stapegotomy. Right. You can see a perforation there and that is inevitable. In a, but you, you know, if you have a perforation, then the thing to do is you can do what is known as a Sheehy technique, you know, which is okay. that you adjust the, it's after all it is a tear, is not it? It is a like a traumatic perforation. So, you can adjust your drum so that the perforation is closed like this and it will heal up. Keep up. If it is very big perforation uh. or if it is a very thin drum due to previous disease, you can keep a little bit of fascia for support underneath that. All right. So, this is a, a stepidotomy. Right. Uh, now, sir, uh, sir, can I um, interpret, sir? Uh, so, Dr. Anand, he wants to know, uh, how can you show it again how to hold the piston and rotate? Okay. Just, uh, uh, yeah, sure, sure, I can do that. Sure. Yeah, or in a fresh piston. Fresh piston, okay. So, it's a fresh piston. But anyway, I, you don't need a fresh piston, I can just show you in this. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Horses. I mean, the idea is is not to you know you all know about how to open the loop and so on. So I don't think that's going to. Okay. So this is the piston. Hold it in a way that the long axis of the forceps and the long axis of the piston are more or less the same axis. Slight inclination. Now when you're going in, go with the loop parallel to the incus like this. Okay, in the same plane as incus, go in, introduce it like this and then once you have gone in, rotate it by 90 degrees and a gentle push forward and it will stick in case. Okay. Thanks, sir. Incus. Uh, yes, sir. Dr. Uh, C. V. Brinda from Puducherry. Um, so, how to calculate the length of the piston? Uh, is there any specific size or height used? Yeah, yeah, I, I showed you. No? See, there is a, yes, a measuring, measuring rod. Uh, just show that. Give me that measuring rod. So, actually, you know, mostly once you have become a little experienced, you can just be visual assessment, you can do it. But, the measuring rod. Not this. Now, the measuring rod you can see here has got three marks, okay. That is 3.75, 4 and 4.25. So, the tip of the rod rests on the foot plate and then you rotate it. So, you see which mark goes to the under surface of the incus, okay. Here it is 4. So, add 0.25 to that. So, that will be the length of the piston that you need. The piston should go into the fenestrum, but not project into the vestibule. In other words, just go beyond the, the uh, foot plate. I do not like vein graft because of the simple reason that, you know, I, I do not want to uh, completely, I, I must see where my tip of my piston is going and then steal off around it with fat. So, that is my own preference, but you know, it's, you, you can do what you want. But I idea is that you make a small fenestrum, you introduce a small piston and seal off around it nicely. And uh, yeah, so then you, of course you crimp it like this, like I already told you. Dr. Nirmal Kumar from Chennai wants to know, um, will you do always under local anesthesia or in any case you do under dental anesthesia? Yeah, good question. The only surgery in autology that I do under local anesthesia is uh, uh, sepidotomy or of course the meningotomy in an adult, but invariably every other operation I do under general anesthesia. I do a stay piece under GA if I think the patient is going to be a problem patient, you know, if he already apprehends. You can actually assess that, but as a rule, always as an anesthetist stand by and if the patient is creating problems, we convert it in the middle of surgery into GA. But generally, this is one procedure I like to do under local anesthesia. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
Okay. Um, Dr. Sandeep from Wu is asking why couplet is perfect in the pushy one time. Yeah, the very good question. Yes. Because you know the angulation is such that if you have made the fenestrum more anteriorly, the incus, uh, I mean the, the piston will be going in that direction. Okay, not in this direction. Now you want to have the transmission of the energy from the incus to the vestibule perpendicular to the incus. If it is like this, it will be more anterior. So, there will be a wastage of energy transmission. That is also the reason why when you put a piston from the malleus to the vestibule, invariably the results are not good, as good as in a regular stepotomy because of the inclination. So, your inclination must be, the piston must be exactly perpendicular or at 90 degrees to the, uh, the incus long process. Okay? Then only the energy transmission is efficient. Yes, sir. And Dr. Anand from Sony Pet, he wants to know, uh, could you explain reverse stepidotomy? Oh, yeah. Well, don't worry about it. You know, that's my advice for you. Don't worry about it. Just do a plain stepidotomy. Don't worry about reverse stepidotomy. Okay? Yeah. yeah. There's so many modifications, but those are not important. Just develop one technique which works well in your hand and then do it. That's it. Thanks. Okay? There are uh, Dr. Nagarajan from Coimbatore. Uh, he's asking in COVID time, Opening the vestibule, is there any risk of uh, sensory loss uh, yeah, well, because of sure, the virus? Definitely, if uh, in a certain conditions, a if there is any endolymphatic high drops, then it's a problem. Okay, so in a patient with uh, uh, autosclerosis who also complains of vertigo or secondary uh, symptoms like endolymphatic high drops, be very very cautious. So, patient autosclerotic patient with vertigo, be very cautious. Also, invariably, I like to do a HRCT of every autosclerotic patient I am going to open up. Okay? I do a CT as a must. And if there is any suggestion of a large vestibular aqueduct or a large cochlear canal or anything at all, then you know that these are patients who have a higher risk. So, the idea is that when you do a, a, a opening of the fenestrum, it must be as atraumatic as possible. So, the, the procedure I like is a, a micro drill. I used to do a lot of lasers initially, but now I, I prefer a micro drill, I use a skeeter drill, very gently, no pressure on the foot plate, take off layer by layer, millimeter by millimeter, blue line it, thin it out and then finally open it. And it must be a very precise opening with no trauma to the foot plate. Okay, but a good question from Raghavaj. He always asks good questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. So, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Uh, Laham from Arunachal Pradesh, Tawang. Uh, sir, how do you manage protein foot plate? Good question, Lang. You know, it's a very good question. You see, this is one of the most difficult, challenging problems, a you know, floating foot plate. And it can happen easily if you have a biscuit foot plate, okay, a biscuit type of autocrosis. So, that is where the technique that I showed you becomes helpful because you've got a small fenestrum already made, right, in the middle of the foot plate. And that fenestrum you can use to hook it, hook up the foot plate and lift it up with a, a pick. So, a very fine pick can go into that fenestrum that you already made, the control fenestrum, and then, you know, hook it and then lift it up. So, that's where this technique that I showed you becomes helpful. Sometimes, let's say you've not done it, okay, and it's, uh, it's, go, it's floated, then what do you do? Then you have to make an opening around the floating foot plate, just beyond that into the side of the, the uh, oval window. So, make an opening there and then introduce a small pick and then, you know, rotate it and hook it up. So, basically, you want to hook it up gently and do it. But if it's very difficult, and these are all things to be done by an expert, just leave it put a piston and come out and later on you can go back and open it and then put a piston in the second stage. So, there is no harm in abandoning the procedure if you are not experienced with it, take it out. But as I said, the, the, the control fenestrum that I showed you, before I cut the tendon, I made the control fenestrum first. That becomes helpful for you in a floating foot plate to put a small pick in and hook it out. Okay? Very, um, so, Dr. Good. Isha from New Delhi, what to do if the posterior superior curating has been done too enthusiastically and we end up in removing too much of bone? Can you repeat that question? What happens if you are? Posterior superior curating, what we do, ah. uh, has been too enthusiastic and we end up in removing too much of bone. Yeah, well, superior curating. you know, you stop the moment you see the horizontal part of the, the horizontal facial canal 
and the tip of the pyramid. This is where you stop. Now, if it is too beyond that and you made a big opening, then you have to reconstruct it with cartilage. You can put a bit of cartilage there to reconstruct. That's not a big problem. But generally, it shouldn't happen because you are, you are taking it layer by layer, small bits, and you are seeing the structure inside. So the moment you start seeing the horizontal part of the facial canal and the tip of the pyramid, that's your cue to stop. Okay. Hi, sir. Hi, sir. Um, Dr. Nagarajan Kayamkoti specifically wants to know, uh, in this COVID era, in, uh, the opening the vestibule in stepidectomy, will it increase the chance of nerve damage? Ah, excellent question. You know, uh, there have been a few reports of, of sudden hearing loss, cochlear loss in COVID patients. It's interesting you bring it up. Uh, and I know, I know at least one patient who had a bilateral profound cochlear loss uh, following COVID in Germany and this patient even had a cochlear implant after that. But generally speaking, you know, the risk of uh, uh, cochlear damage in COVID era is probably not too much, you know, it's probably exaggerated a bit. Uh, I think, you know, if you've done a preoperative assessment and the assessment includes a COVID test, there's no history of contact, the patient is fine and you've done this procedure, this shouldn't be too much. And if you put a seal also. Fine, sir. Yeah. Fine, sir. Um, Dr. Ravi Kumar from Tumaku, how about doing stepidectomy by post-oral by juniors instead of transcanal? No, well, you can. There's no problem. You know, you can do it. Uh, you can also do endoral. A lot of surgeons do endoral. Uh, or you want to do, if you're comfortable doing post-oral, do it. In that way, you have two hands, you know, you can use it. No problems. Uh, it's absolutely, see, the incision is only an approach, right? It's only an approach. As, I have no problems about that. Uh, if you are comfortable doing it transcanal, you can do it. It's not a procedure. It's very difficult to do it transcanal, as it sounds. Uh, but uh, the postural route is what you like to do and you have both your hands free and you want to do it. Initially, uh, do it. No problems. Thank you. And Dr. Malavika Suresh from Bangalore, is there a use for vein graft in floating foot plate? No, not particularly in floating foot plate. You know, a floating foot plate is a foot plate which is floating and it's still there. So just putting a bit of tissue on top of it doesn't you know, stop the floating. So either you take out the floating foot plate and uh, you know put your piston and seal it off. And sealing could be with vein graft or fat or anything, it doesn't matter. Or if you can't take the floating foot plate out, just leave it, come out, go back later because the floating foot plate will fix up. You know, three months later you can go back and then you know you're more comfortable to do it. And next time you go, have somebody senior with you to help you out also. Dr. Alak Vettivel from Madurai wants to know about accidental displacement of foot plate into vestibule while making fenestra. Yeah, that's a disaster. So it's how to disaster. Yeah. Very difficult. Don't meddle. Just don't meddle. Leave it, you know, put your piston and come out, seal it and come out and the chances are, there's a very high chance of a co cochlear loss in this patient. So accidental displacement into the vestibule, the chances of a cochlear loss is very, very high. Dr. Ramaniraj from Chennai wants to know how to proceed when there is a persistent stepidial artery. Very good question. You know, uh, I've seen a persistent epidural artery at least about four times you know, so far in sepidectomies. I've never had to abandon the procedure, Ramniraj. You know, it's never had to do that. The, uh, you can always go behind the sepidural artery because usually the sepidural artery will go in the, you know, in the middle or anterior third of the foot plate. So you can go behind it and you can make a fenestrum and do it. If it bleeds, then you know, it can be a nuisance, but you can stop it always with, with cautery. Uh, but if you're going to cauterize it, go away from the facial canal and uh, you know do it not near the facial canal. Uh, but generally speaking, you have a lot of space behind the artery for you to go in and put your foot plate, or uh, put your piston. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Nishikanta from uh, from Bhubaneswar wants to know, sir, how will you manage your processes in displacement? Some repeated questions. How do I manage my processes? Displacement. Process displacement. Okay. I mean, that's a, you know, a long-term yeah. problem, not immediately. Problem. So, if a patient comes with recurrent conductive hearing loss, you know, then you can open up and see. And if you see a piston is displaced, take it out. It could happen due to many reasons, either because it's, it's not been put in the right place or because the piston is a bit shorter, <coughs> shorter than it should be and new autosclerotic focus has formed and lifted up the piston, you know, that can happen. So take it out, make uh, make sure the fenestrum is still open and then put back a new piston. 
Dr. Raghunandan, uh, Chennai wants to know what's the role of perioperative steroid? Perioperative steroid, yeah. If there has been trauma, you know, in your procedure, like introducing a piston or somewhere, then of course immediate steroids should be given. Um, generally speaking, you know, if uh, there, there has been some, uh, uh, you know, rough handling, it's always a good idea to give a little bit of steroids because it also uh, helps in reducing the emesis, the vomiting in the patient postoperatively. So you can give intraoperative soon, soon or immediate postop, you can give a. A, a dose of dexamethasone or methylprednisone. Thanks, sir. Dr. Praveen from Calicut. No, uh, will you face uh, what are situations where we face postoperative vertigo? Postoperative. Yeah, actually, postoperative vertigo is very subjective. You see, it depends varies very much from patient to patient. In some patients, they'll have no vertigo at all. In some, they'll have significant vertigo. And uh, generally speaking, the less trauma in the foot plate and the vestibule, the less the, uh, the vertigo. Uh, but the very fact that you're making a fenestrum and putting a piston in itself is trauma. You know, you can't avoid that. Uh, so uh, that's where, as Raghunandan asked, you know, you can maybe give some steroids immediately. But generally speaking, you know, uh, it's a good idea. So I give phenergan as a part of the pre-med. Which is an antiemetic. If there is a, if the patient has, uh, you know, a significant uh, nausea postoperatively, you can also use prochlorpyrazine stematil uh, in the postoperative period. The dose is 12.5 milligrams per ml intramuscular, and uh, usually that will take care of the vertigo. Patient may have vertigo for a day, sometimes vi very violent vertigo for a day or two, but invariably it will settle down after about 48 to 72 hours. Thanks, sir. Um, Dr. Sai Pralrama Krishna from Vishapatnam, what's the ideal age of doing stepidotomy in a child? Ah, in a child, you have to be very careful because it may not be autosclerosis at all, you know, it may be something else, it may be congenital septal fixation. Uh, so, invariably, you must get a scan done, you know, to make sure that there is no other associated because there is a congenital septal fixation, good chances of some other anomaly like a large vestibular aqueduct or a cochlear canal equivalent or so. Where the risk of CS, you know, CSF leak is there, a risk of uh, you know uh, profound uh, cochlear loss. So uh, first of all, assess, make sure your diagnosis is accurate. But if you are uh, fairly sure about your diagnosis, usually I like to wait for until the child is a little older, so about 10 to 12 at least. And uh, in fact, the uh, age that I prefer in children is at least about 12 years of age. So till then, I encourage them to use a hearing aid. And then after they cross 12, then take them up for stepidotomy. Thanks, sir. Dr. Mudit Mishra from Bareilly, how much stepidotomy may be helpful in improving tinnitus in autosclerosis? So in tinnitus, you see, uh, it's again a very good question. You cannot assure the patient that tinnitus will disappear. But what you can tell them is that once the hearing improves, the severity of the tinnitus will come down. The tinnitus very often becomes more manageable for the patient. In some, it will disappear altogether. In some, uh, I would say in about okay. a third of patients, it will disappear. In about a third, it will become very much less, uh, significantly less. Probably now another third, uh, you know, maybe not too much, but invariably there will be some improvement in the patient. Okay? Can we move on? It's a lot of questions are coming up, so we will move on to the next I think exercise. We'll move on because otherwise we'll be stuck with stapes, you know, nothing else will be done. Yes, sir. So as we yes, go sir. on, then the end, end of it, we can again give time for all these questions. You know, because stapes yes, itself is a, is a huge topic, that's a problem, you know. Right, yes, let's sir. go on to the next, uh, you know, I'm going to start off with a cortical mastodectomy, sometimes called a simple mastodectomy, but there's nothing simple about it. It's the gateway to the temporal bone, very, very important procedure. So let's start off with the temporal bone. Okay, where's my micromotor? Give me a last. So first thing to do is to mark out the McEwen's line, the triangle. So McEwen's triangle is drawn by drawing the supramastoid crest or supramastoid line, which is the posterior extension of the zygoma. Another along the posterior canal wall. Okay, and then a tangent drawn connecting these two lines, a transient to the external artery canal connecting these. So, that is the McEwen's triangle. So, that roughly gives you the position of the mastoid antrum, about uh, you know 1.5 centimeters deep to it. Uh, 
So let's uh, start it off. Now, uh, you know, use a large cutting board and uh, go along the lines that you have marked. And needless to say, never keep it in one place, but keep stroking. That way you have much better control over the, the burr. I can already start to see some air cells appearing. So this is a 6 mm burr. The largest one you have is what you should be using. Now, when you are using a burr, your, all your senses must be in alert, the largest. Huh? So, you are alert. So, not only looking at the, the area that you are burring, but also listening to the note of the burr. It is very important. So, here in the art of temporal bone surgery is to be able to anticipate structures before they appear. And for that, you must be always a good surgeon has all his senses in alert. So, use irrigation, irrigation to wash away the bone dust and also to cool the bone, ok. We are a hand piece master, you can put it in the key. So, wash the bone and cool the bone at the same time. Now, the contour of the posterior bony canal is very important, you know, you have to keep it as a landmark. So, always follow this contour. Now, you can already start to see some subtle color changes here, okay, a little bluish color coming up here. So, I must be on the alert, you know, it could be indicate to me a uh, sigmoid sinus due to that. So, Dr. Sanjeev looking wants listening to, to the sound. Explain. Of Again, subtle color differences coming up here. Remember, in a, in a patient, you will have some warning, of course. 
there will be some bleeding when you are reaching the skull base. But here in the temporal bone you won't get that. So it's very easy to go through the bone there. So don't worry about it. You know. So as you are following the contour of the posterior canal wall, keep blocked. It should also, you should also keep the posterior canal wall thin. Keep it thin everywhere. As you go on, don't keep it very thick. The thicker you keep, the more posterior you are going and the more structures you can damage. So, always the trick is to keep the posterior canal wall thin. Now, you can see this bluish color is becoming much more prominent now. So, I know it is a sigmoid sinus, it is quite uh, superficial. So, Dr. Prabhakar wants to know uh, from Perambalur, uh, what is Malabas? the importance and significance? Dr. Prabhakar ah. uh, was asking, what is the significance of coronary septum? Coronary septum is actually quite rare, you know, a lot of people over diagnose it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, there's no significance, you know, excepting that it can confuse the surgeon a bit uh, and, and you have to uh, always, always the way you diagnose a coronary septum is see the depth of the septum and compared to the depth of the tympanic membrane. You know. So, roughly, you know, uh, the antrum should be corresponding to the level of the tympanic membrane. If it is, if your septum is much higher, then you know that this is a false septum. But a lot of people, you know, see like you have a bit of bone here, a lot of people say coronary septum if there is no cells here, but it is not coronary septum, you know. Always open out the root of zygoma. Very important. And keep the Muni wall sloping. Never be a overhang. Now there is a small change in note, okay. So I know that I am reaching a big space there, all the space, and I am probably going to be opening into the antrum pretty soon. So I go down to one size smaller. Sir, Dr. Suhas from Raichu. Uh, is asking uh, some tips for about a contracted mastoid. Contracted mastoid, yeah. Contracted is not a problem, you know. The, it's the same thing. I mean, the tips are the same. Keep your posterior canal wall thin. That's the biggest tip that I can give you, okay. Keep the posterior canal wall thin. Open the zygoma, you'll get more space. And follow the contour of the posterior canal wall. That's all the three tips. Yes, sir. Dr. Nainar from Tirchandur, um, Wants to know about uh, what? What question? No, actually, he wants to know about bridge reduction. So that we will be discussing in uh, later on. Later later. Down so I'm talking about yes, cortical method me now. Yes, sir. Doctor Ravi Kumar from Tumkur. Want, uh, when do you advise HRCT? HRCT in temp tem HRCT temple board. Yeah, I do it before. Have yes, sir. Session for that, you know, it's a, it's a big yes, topic, sir. right? Yes. I have a separate question for that. Okay, so now I am opening into the antrum. Is 
Okay, so how do I know this is the antrum? Okay, the reason I know it's the antrum is because of this structure here, and this structure, which you can see, is a white, dense white color, different from the color of the surrounding bone. You can make out the subtle color difference here in between this bone and this is white. Okay, and ivory white bone. That is the inner ear, isn't it? That's the part of the inner ear, and that is the lateral semicircle. Can all? It's the first part of the inner ear that you are going to be. See, and the moment you identify the lateral semicircle canal, you know that you are in the antrum because the lateral canal forms the floor of the antrum. Dr. Muhammad Iqbal from Lahore, Pakistan, is asking uh, about uh, doing mastectomy with the hammer and tools. What's your experience? Ah, good question. <laughs> yeah, interesting. You know, I actually started with the hammer and tools uh, when I started training, uh, and uh, you know, of course, you know, very soon we changed out our drill. But uh, you know, Iqbal, let me tell you, uh, one of the best uh, surgeons uh, I've ever seen operators in Scotland, in Glasgow, is a gentleman called McGilvray, uh, and he was a you know hammer and gouge man, and he used to be doing such beautiful cavities, you know, smooth cavities with the mallet and gouge. I've never seen even as a drill anybody make such a smooth cavity, and he was a, a sculptor. He was actually a sculptor. He used to sculpt uh, st statues in his house, you know. But the man was remarkable. He'll take about four and a half hours for a mastectomy, but it will be a piece of art. So you can do a good job, you know. But you need to have really sharp instruments, you know. Don't have blunt instruments because then you produce fractures, which are outside your control. So you can do a good job, but of course it's much more tedious, more cumbersome, and you have to have much more skills for that. It's much better to use a drill and learn with a drill. Uh, he also wants to uh, know of the protocol what we followed during uh, this COVID pandemic for a mastectomy. Yeah, I think uh, you know you, I, 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 you should address him to the Indian Academy website. Yes, uh, we have uh, that all recorded. All the details session. are there, Iqbal, in, in uh, Indian Academy website. I A O H N S. I A O H N S. Indian H -N -S. Academy of Water Radiology Head and Neck Surgery. Uh, there are a lot of pictures and everything, and everything is there. It's a detail because we had a very long discussion about it. A lot of experts, and we we have we have uh, drawn up some recommendations. So you can visit that website, and you'll get a lot of information uh, in that. Sir, Dr. Ravi Kishore from Balari, uh, is there any difference between McEwen's triangle and uh, triangle of attack? Triangle of what? Triangle of attack. Attack. <laughs> That's the first time yes, I, I don't know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sounds like very gruesome. <laughs> you don't want to attack you actually. We can help it. I don't know. I really don't know. Honestly, it's the first time I'm hearing about a triangle of attack. Maybe it's there in some book. But uh, yeah. make your triangle is what that, I know. 
Dr. Suhas from Rai Chow uh, asking to show the Donaldson's line. What? Donaldson's line. Donaldson's line, yeah, we can do that, yeah. Donaldson's line will, will be more useful when you are coming to the second second part of our discussion. Yes, the next Sunday, but basically it's an imaginary line which you draw along the long axis of the, uh, uh, the uh, lateral canal and it will bisect the posterior canal into two. It is useful for you know, when you are doing the endolymphatic sac surgery. Okay, now you can all see the phenomenon of the shy incus. Now, if you look carefully here, you can see the shadow of the incus here. Okay. Now, when I suck it out, that disappears. All right. But when I put a little bit of saline, the incus will come into view. Right, there you are. Okay. That's the incus there. You can see now. When I suck it out, it disappears. That's because of refraction. It's like the incus is trying to hide and you're trying to bring it out. So, as I said as in the very beginning that the art of temple bone surgery is to be able to anticipate structures okay, before they appear. And this is one such uh, maneuver the surgeon does so that you can actually start prove, you know, predicting that the incus is going to be there and even before it appears, you are actually seeing it. Uh, sir, Dr. Sanjeev Gurha from Nagpur ah. is asking about the speed and direction of birth. Like he wants to be asked specifically the direction, rotation uh, direction, of and clockwise anti clockwise. Clock, always clockwise. Always clockwise. What is the important? Always clockwise. What is the importance of yeah, anti clockwise? Birth, is, birth is designed for clockwise rotation. Okay, only then it can. Really, if it's anti clockwise, it will it will not be cutting anything. So use a clockwise birth and clockwise rotation. Right now, I have exposed the incus a little bit. Okay, you can see the incus there, and I also opened out a bit of the epitympanum there. Okay, and superiorly above the incus, you can see this mucosal fold here. That's the superior incudal fold. Okay, so you can all see that. Now, the moment I, I disrupt this fold, it's a very thin fold. Then just in front. Can of we the, find focus it, sir? Yeah, sure. Is it better? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, just in front of it, incus is the head of the malleus. There, that's the incudomalleolar joint here. Can you all see that? That's the head of malleus, and this is the incus, body of incus. If I go a little further, I will see here. Let me open it out a bit more. If I open it a bit more, then I will see the, the head of malleus. So, what I am doing now is actually opening into the epitympanum. Okay? Dr. Panchanan from Katak, uh, how to identify the shadow of incus? So, you saw that just now. You know. yeah. yeah. I just saw that. You will see when you put saline, you will see the shadow coming. You suck out the saline, it will disappear. Okay. So, this is the head of malleus, and you can see the superior malleolar ligament there. Okay. That is a thick ligament, unlike the superior incredible fold, it is a thick ligament. Sometimes it may get ossified and may cause conductive hearing loss, mimicking autosclerosis. So, whenever you have diagnosed autosclerosis, you open up and you see that the stapes is mobile. Next thing you should think about is the head of malleus. Is it fixed? So, it could either be fixed because of this ossification of the superior uh, malleolar ligament. Tympanosclerosis may affect that ligament, you know, it can cause fixation. 
Occasionally, anterior malleolar ligament may also get fixed. So, these are the possibilities. Okay, so I have done that. Now, let us come down a bit and then you know a little bit more towards the tip, we have a little bit more work. Give me a slightly bigger bar and a bigger <coughs> section also. Give me a 5 millimeter bar. bigger bar please, 6 millimeter. So, I am now opening into the tip cells here, you can see that. It's too big. There are a couple of questions like how do you trace the short process of incurs after opening the antrum and how to avoid injury to incurs then? How do you, how do you, how do you sorry? How Tra do you trace how do you trace the short process of incurs okay. after opening the antrum? Yeah, yeah, we will we'll come to that. I'll just come to that. Okay, so I have now opened the tip also and more or less completed the procedure. Let me just tell you what are all the things I am seeing now. So, that is the tip opened out and you can see some superficial cells and some deep cells. That is the, the bulge of the sigmoid sinus. That is the tegment here. You can see the color which is different from between this and this. Lateral canal, thinned out posterior canal. We still do a bit more thinning there. Keep the posterior canal wall thin, always thin. You will see very soon why it has to be kept thin. What's the advantage? I'll show it you a little later. But always keep thin, keep it thin. But without making an opening in it, of course. Okay, now give me a smaller bar. Now, you wanted to know about the short process of the incus. There it is. The important thing is your bar should never touch the ossicle. Okay, so keep very, very, very strict about it. And you are working parallel to it and work from inside out so that you expose the, the length of the short process. Now this is the fossa incudis here. Okay, I've not fully opened it, but that is where the ligament is going to be. But you can see the whole length of the short process there. There is the body and the long and the short process of the incus. Okay. Right. So, lateral canal here, lateral canal here, now you may pick and this is the aditus of course, this is the aditus here going in, that is the epitympanum and so you stop your procedure here, this is where the procedure stops. So, you have exposed the 
master antrum. You have uh, drilled out so that you have thinned out the bone up to the tegmen and up to the sigmoid sinus plate. You have got the lateral canal here. Between the sigmoid sinus plate and the tegmen, you have this space which is more like a, uh, a shallow trough rather than a, a groove, but it is called the, the sinodural angle. Uh, so, this is the sinodural angle here. The sigmoid sinus can be traced down to the tip and here you have the tip cells, superficial tip cells and some deep cells and between the two you have this very subtle ridge here which is the digastric ridge. Okay, which is if I drill more, I will be opening up into the digastric muscle there. That is the short process of the incus going on to the fossa inquity which is going to be there and uh, you know there is a post all wall and later on we will be exposing the facial nerve somewhere there, we will come to that in a minute. That is the tegmen here, sigmoid sinus, sinodural angle, the root of zygoma opened out. So, you can see the, the entire length of the uh, incus, the body and the short process of the incus and the, uh, the, the uh, space of the epitympanum and the aditus ad antrum. So, this is where you stop, this is where the cortical mastectomy uh, you know is, uh, is completed. Do not go chasing every cell, you know, that is not the idea. The idea is that you have nicely opened out and exposed the space. Okay? Now, if uh, you have questions here at this stage, you can ask me, otherwise, we will go on to the next procedure, which is the posterior temporotomy. Uh, sir, Dr. Anand from Sonipat uh, and Divya from Kaligar wants to know what do we do if we accidentally make a hole in the posterior canal wall? Yeah. While thinning Good it? question. Yeah. Sometimes it can happen, you know, if, it, if you are not careful. But if it happens, reconstruct it. Okay, there are you can there many ways you can reconstruct it. The simplest is if you take a bit of cartilage from the tragus, from the tragus. You can use it. Uh, you know, lift a bit of cartilage from the tragus and lift up the the skin of the posterior canal wall and tuck it in, and uh, you then you can put a, a bit of fascia and then skin over it. Or you can use bone uh, dust if you have collected bone dust. Uh, as long as it is not diseased, uh, you know, bone, you can use the bone dust also to repair it, it will also hold. Uh, ideally, a bit of cartilage uh, with fascia over it and then the skin on top of it, that is the way you read it. Um, so, Dr. Mithun from Calicut, uh, asking why to keep the posterior canal wall very thin? Yeah, you will see in a minute. I, I am going to just uh, you know yes, explain sir. to you. We you will actually see it better later. So, just hold that question for a few for a few minutes more, then I will explain. Yes, sir. Dr. Alkesh uh, Oswal um, wants to know Sorry, Vijay? Do you advise cortical mastectomy in every case of tympanoplasty Very good. or is there any specific well, I generally, most cases, you know, anybody who has had a long standing perforation, I do it for a simple reason. There is a lot of hidden disease in the antrum in our country, you know, in chronic years. You may have a dry year with a perforation, you open up, you will be quite surprised to see quite a lot of granulations in the, uh, you know, antrum. You may argue say, that may not be important, but I think, you know, even if it makes a difference in, in 2 percent or 1 percent of patients, it is still worth it. It'll take another 10 minutes extra, 15 minutes extra you ensure that your results are better, it is always worth it. I like to open the antrum, ensure that the additus is patent and then put a graft. Okay. Thanks. And uh, so, what are the chances of injuring facial nerve during uh, simple mastectomy and not, how to avoid? Happen. No excuse for that. Okay. <laughs> so, if, if it happens, that means, you know, you really have to go back to the, the, the temporal bone. Temporal bone yeah. This section. Okay. Shall we yes, go ahead? Sir. Yes, sir. Right. So, now we are going to do the next procedure, which is the posterior tympanotomy. Now, the posterior tympanotomy… Uh, sir, before that, sir, uh, one second. Dr. Jagan Mohan Reddy uh, from Chief Minister Peta, how do you select the burr size to drill and how to prevent tremors while drilling? What is the secret of your stable hands? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not the chief minister asking me question. <laughs> okay, right. I, I, I let me tell you, you know, that uh, very many years ago, you know, I and I was working in uh, with a very nice gentleman. He, he, you know, his name was Omar Shaheen. He is a famous uh, thyroid surgeon. So he told me, he said, you want to take up ear surgery, forget about beer. Okay, so <laughs> not for beer drinkers. So, alcohol does not mix with autology, you know, that is the first thing you know, I must tell you. 
and uh, the second thing is uh, also you know uh, the smoking is not a good thing also so these are all things which will help you to reduce your uh, tremors but more than that it's a question of working again and again doing it again and again and getting the hang of it okay that gives you the confidence to do it that's all okay right so let's go on to a post it impromptu now now to do the post impromptu the, the most important thing is to have a thin post taken all wall okay now the already we have done a little bit of thinning but we'll do a little bit more a little bigger bar please uh, let's say a 4 mm bar yeah and uh, you know keep it very very thin in fact the the ideal uh, thickness is that it should be like a bone china so what is a good bone china you know if you have a very good bone china you can actually keep the bone china let's say a bone china cup it's a very expensive bone china cup how do you know it's a very good quality you take the cup and you keep it against light at the bottom you will see a portrait coming up but if you look at it from above you will not see anything it will be opaque but if you show it against light it will be translucent and you can see a portrait of a of a chinese girl a chinese princess now that tells you it's a genuine bone china and you can pay you know 6 7000 dollars for it if it doesn't show it's only 600 rupees you know so there's a big difference so the bone china should be opalescent it should be translucent and that's how thin your bone should be without making an opening and this is where your practice comes in a temple bone dissection uh, sir can i interrupt for a minute there are few uh, newcomers have joined just want to have some instruction yeah sure go ahead please ah uh, sir um uh, please type your questions in the box given in the web page it will be answered shortly and uh, e certificate will be provided at the end of the session once the session is over please reload or refresh the page the link will be activated to enter the details to receive the certificate to your email id please don't resubmit please don't put dr as a prefix please check your email inbox or spam folder you have received the certificate i can play a short video at following which we can start the dissection So always work parallel to the fascia now. So where do I, where is the fascia now? How do I know where the fascia now is? That's where your incus comes in. Now the incus short process is like a pointing finger. Okay, it's known as the incus pointer. The incus short process is like a pointing finger there, and the finger points to the fascia now. So I would expect the fascia now to be somewhere in this area. Okay, so this is where it's going to be. a lot of cells here smaller bar please right now i can answer the question why do you want the canal wall thin now if i have a thick canal wall just imagine what will happen so here is the canal wall all right and uh, you you have a thick canal wall so the canal wall is going to be somewhere there so i go like this then this is where the fascia nerve is i'm going straight to the fascia nerve but as a more thin i have the more anterior i go i'm going in front of the fascia nerve so this is where the fascia nerve is i'm going to go in front of it okay so i'm going by thinning it i am protecting my facial nerve i am moving anterior to the facial nerve okay so that explains you why you want to have a thin posterior canal it's always safer
irrigation on correct color. Also, Dr. Tanya Rajan from Trandrum, what is sentinel cell? Sentinel cell, yeah. Sentinel cell is usually a cell which is present about two-thirds of the temporal bone and if it is present, it will be, in, it's a perifacial cell. So, if the facial canal is here, it will be somewhere there and it will take you directly into the, directly into the facial reserve. Okay. So, this is actually somewhere here. So, in fact, there is a cell there. It could be that facial cell there. We don't know. Let's see. So, if it is a, it's a pre-existing cell which can directly lead you into the facial reserve. Fine, sir. Dr. Kalyan Sundaram uh, from Erod, how often you encounter abnormal course of facial nerve? Not very often, you know, excepting in congenital years. The moment you see uh, abnormal, it means, you know, you are in an abnormal anatomy. That uh, actually happens when you have a congenital, you know, year. So, when you are doing cochlear implants, you may see it in about 10 percent of, uh, you know, bones. But normal mustard surgeries you shouldn't see too often, very rare. Yes, Dr. Ashish from Nagpur uh, is asking about precautions to be taken while performing cortical mastectomy in a children for cochlear implant. Yeah, well, you know, the, the more or less the same, but excepting that you, you don't want to, you know, you must remember the facial nerve is a little more superficial, so you have to be a little cautious there. And, uh, you know, you don't want to go too near the tip also, so those are the things. Otherwise, in a cortical implant, it's a normal mastectomy, so you don't have to worry too much about it. Thanks, Normal sir. cellular mass, right? Yeah. Dr. Ramesh Rogival uh, is asking uh, about uh, anatomical landmarks for posterior tympanotomy. Yeah, I'm going to come in a minute. Ah, fine. Dr. Ramesh Rogival from Trandrum, what Okay, so you wanted to know about sentinel cell. You can now see the sentinel cell there. That's a small sentinel cell. So I stuck there. You can see. Can that you please center it, sir? Sorry. And better? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that's a sentinel cell there. And if I suck in the sentinel cell, you can see that the suction is going into the middle layer and into the into the additors also here. So I know that this is going into the facial recess. Okay, that's the sentinel cell. smaller burma. So, the facial is here okay, and I am going anterior to the facial and that is possible because I have thinned out the posicon already. If I had not thinned it out, I would be much more posterior and directly on to the facial nerve. Okay, so now comes the question of the landmarks for the posterior impronotomy. The landmark is known as the antrum threshold angle and it corresponds to the facial recess. Okay, the facial recess is in the middle ear part, the antrum threshold angle is in the mastoid part, the same uh, dimensions. So, the antrum threshold angle consists of three landmarks. One is the facial nerve here, the other is the incus short process and the third is a cauda tympani which is just starting to appear here. You can just see that shadow there, that is the cauda tympani there. So, cauda tympani which comes here, facial nerve which comes here and the incus here, incus and this is a, a bit of bone I have kept there to protect the short process it's known as the incus buttress. So, incus, facial nerve, cauda tympani, diamond, small diamond. So, if you put the three together that is the antrum threshold angle 
and that would also correspond to the facial recess in the middle ear. So, the middle ear if you draw that line it is called the facial recess. The same line drawn in the mastoid side it is known as the antrum threshold angle. Okay. So, I am now changing over to a diamond burr so I am very very close to the facial nerve there. The facial also is a little Sir, Dr. Carnage uh, deserved from Goa uh, is asking about the hand keys and the drill which you are using as it has irrigation port in it. Yeah. This is the uh, uh, what what bird is Banner. 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 The Swiss company is a good bird actually, it is very sturdy. Also, Zomed also has a bird which has got a bit irrigation. Dr. Vivek from Heiser is asking, how do you identify facial nerve if the incus is necrotic? How do you identify facial nerve? In in case where the incus is absent or necrotic. Oh, you don't have to depend. I mean, incus is only a landmark, see. Landmark. Of, yeah, it is only a landmark. You don't, you're not depending on the incus all the time. Sometimes, you know, it may not be present. So, you have to know that in a roughly in relationship to the lateral canal, it is much more uh, anterior and it is medial to it. So, that is one landmark you can use, but you know roughly where you have the incus will be, even if incus is not present, you can always know where it is because you have the aditus there. But normally when you have a necrotic incus, the short process will always be there. It is a long process which will undergo necrosis. The short process very rarely undergoes necrosis, unless this is very very extensive and that is because the short process gets its supply from the ligament, the posterior ligament of incus, which is a very tough ligament and has a lot of blood vessels on it. Okay, so we are very very close now to opening it and I just want to show again the landmarks. Give me a pointer please. Okay, now if you look carefully you can identify the corda there, all right, that is the corda. Is it seen? I do not know whether it is seen there. That is the shadow of the corda tympani there. Can you yes, see? sir, we can yeah. see. Yes, sir. Corda there. Okay, and the facial is here. This is the canal of the facial. Incus. So, this is the triangle that we are talking about, okay. The antrum threshold angle and you can see that I am almost entering into the facial recess there. I'm almost a bit of bone and thin bone and some mucous membrane there. Let us open it. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Nirmal Kumar uh, is asking me what is the uh, uh, size, how to choose the size of cutting burr uh, for posterior tendon anatomy and size can we use diamond burr yeah. and will it make any difference? No, no, no use the cutting burr initially. I am only using diamond burr at the very fag end, you know, just at the tip to at the end of it to open the bone. But otherwise use cutting burr because cutting burr, many advantages are that A, you know, it's got teeth, so you get water in, so it cools more than a diamond burr. Diamond burr heats up much more. Yes, sir. And secondly, yes. cutting burr will open out the cells, so you can seize landmarks. So diamond burr will obliterate the cells, so you will not see the landmarks. Okay, so I'm just opening Fine. now, uh, and you can uh, see the first straight away. You can see the tendon there, the tendon of sapedius. Don't forget, you already cut it. Um, uh, sir, uh, there is a comment by um, Lieutenant General M.D. Venkatesh, sir, from Manipal. <laughs> Dear Mohan, really enjoying the dissection. Most appreciable part is the speed of drilling, the direction of drilling and the choice of uh, size of burr at critical areas. Truly remarkable and great master at work, not differentiating a cadaveric dissection and a live patient. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Venkatesh. This is a comment coming from a a big master. <laughs> 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 so it's not a small compliment, it's a big compliment. 
Thank yes, you very sir. much. Thank you very much. He's the Vice Chancellor of uh, Manipal. Uh, you know, he's a wonderful surgeon, uh, a great human being. He's a friend, the architect of uh, cochlear implant surgery in the armed forces. So he's a great man. Now I'm just uh, slowly widening the window that I made. Remember the corda we already displaced in the tapis surgery, but you can see the shadow of the corda here in the bone. You can also start to see the piston now. Yeah, that's the piston there, and let me take it out. You can see the pyramid now. This is the pyramid here, tendon coming off the pyramid there. Okay, that's a long process, lenticular process, and the tendon getting attached to the this, the, the neck or the stapes or to the lenticular process. Right now, let us extend it a bit more, thinning out the incus buttress a bit more. Now, this angle here between the incus buttress and the lateral border of this window that you made, this angle here is known as Mike's corner after Michael Glasscock. Now, he was the one who showed that the more you expose here, the more of the long process of the incus that you will expose. Okay, so let's just show that. So if I open up here, Um, so, Dr. Abba from Delhi uh, is asking, what are the uh, other places where uh, we do post-it implantomy, like in cholesterol and what, what is yeah, the significance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Abba? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, normally, you would uh, do it in uh, cholesterol, which is a limited disease, where you can preserve the post all wall, or, you know, in non cholestomatous uh, chronic arteritis media, uh, where there is extensive granulations and so on. Or if you have a, an intact ossicular chain with a lot of granulations in the uh, region of the uh, sinus tympani and uh, pyramid and so on, and you want to expose it and clear it without disturbing the ossicular chain, again, it's a very good option. It's a procedure we do in quite often in glomus tympanicum. Uh, it's uh, very often done there, uh, and so on. So you know, quite a lot of indications nowadays. Yeah. Yes. Professor Dr. Zeno from Iraq. Uh, what's no, uh, what are the difficulties we face and how to manage uh, when there is an abnormal uh, course of facial nerve during post-it implantation? Yeah, uh, we are going to actually see the facial nerve shortly. Uh, so, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll talk about it later there. But generally, you know, the, the whole point is identifying the facial nerve right? and, and uh, looking for it. So, make friends with it. That's, that's really what you want. <coughs> Dr. Anand from Sony Press is asking, is there any advantage of entering the middle ear by elevating tympanometal flap first before posterior tympanotomy? Well, you know, for example, if you are going to be doing a cochlear implant, you don't want to do that, right? You don't want to open the middle ear at all. You want to isolate the middle ear from the external canal, which is very infected. So as far as possible, posterior tympanotomy in a situation like that, you know, it depends on what indication you're going to be doing. If you're going to be doing it for a chronic ear, of course, yes, you know, you can do that. But if you're going to be doing it for a cochlear implant or a middle ear implant, you know, then you don't want to do that because the external canal connecting the external canal with the middle ear exposes the middle ear to more infection. Right now, uh, let me just show you. So I've just opened the mic's uh, corner. 
and you can see definitely a lot more of the long process now, right. So, give me a pick and this is the approach that you want to be doing for middle ear implants. Supposing you want to do a vibrant sound bridge, this is the approach that you would be, this is the exposure that you want. So, you do not want to just do a post implantotomy, you also want to expose a quite a bit of the long process of the incus, all right. So, this is the Mike's corner, right. Now, if you are going to be doing a cochlear implant, let us say, or if you just want to do a for a chronic ear, it is this is not where you want, you want more inferior extension. That is could be this is known as a extended post implantotomy, in which case sometimes you have to sacrifice the cauda tympani, you know, if you really want to go down, but majority of the cochlear implants you do not have to do that. Now, here I am just starting to see the shadow of the round window membrane. Now, you will recognize that it is the round window niche, sorry not membrane, that is a round window niche here. You can see a gentle shadow there, a smaller suction please. So, let us uh, extend it a bit more to expose the round window now. If you have a high insertion of the uh, corda, then of course, corda will be damaged. Sir, uh, Dr. Ali Shaikh from Amalapuram, uh, can you enlighten us about the caudal crest? About the? Caudal crest. Caudal crest, okay, okay. We will. Okay, so <coughs> now I am just exposing the hypotympanum there. Can you see that? That is the hypotympanic cells which are coming up. So, that is the hypotympanic cells are coming up. Now, this is round window niche here, hypotympanum, promontory, you can see the pyramid, you can see the uh, tendon, you can see the additus and if I tilt it nicely, give me a beals please, I can also see the under surface of the tympanic membrane there with a malleus handle there in the distance that is handle of malleus okay. And I can even go more anteriorly if I have dealt with the incus and, and I can see on the promontory give me a pointer please on the promontory I can see a subtle line there that is the tympanic nerve, okay, that is the tympanic nerve and more anteriorly will be of course, the anterior part of the mesotympanum and all going on to the eustachian tube. So, this is a versatile approach, you know, from one end you can see the horizontal part of the facial nerve here, this is the horizontal part of the facial nerve, you can see the process cochlearyform is there, that is the process cochlearyform is, that is the horizontal part of the facial, process cochlearyform is, the incus, you already saw the handle of malleus, you saw the lenticular process, tendon, pyramid, second genu here, promontory and you can see the tympanic plexus there. And then I tilt the microscope a little bit, I can see the round window niche. And you can see the hypotympanum. So, you have a versatile approach, you know, it is a very versatile approach. And you can see quite a bit of the important part of the middle ear, which is the posterior half of the middle ear, right. So, now let us complete what you have done now a little bit more. We already exposed the course of the facial now, right. 
bigger section one. Now I am just opening up the facial canal. You can see actually start to see the facial canal getting opened again already. So, Dr. Kadeshwar from Bhuvaneshwar is asking, can we clear the cholesterol from deep sinus tympani in this uh, extended post Yeah, yeah you, can, you can. You have a very good approach to the uh, incus. And you can also nowadays you have very fine autoendoscopes which you can use to inspect the area also, isn't it? So, you have the advantage of combining an endoscopy with microscopy. And many are asking whether this uh, recorder video is available in uh, later. Yes, the video is getting recorded and it will be uploaded in the same site and also in the YouTube. Uh, Dr. Vivek Rajan from Chennai uh, is asking, uh, en can you en enlighten us about anatomical variations of round window and no, the landmarks? Yeah. Round, see, the thing is, uh, uh, round window is like a fingerprint, you know, no two round windows are ever alike and even in the same patient, between the right side and left side you will find a lot of variations. So, it's a lot of variations, but generally speaking, the round window which you see is a niche, okay, that's not the actual round window. And uh, you have to, uh, you know, you actually, I'll, I'll, we'll show that in a minute, but you have to actually open it up the niche and then only you will see the round window membrane. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute, let me just uh, finish this. I'll show the round window membrane now. Round window is actually a very fascinating structure. Sir, uh, Dr. Palnepan uh, Trichy from Dr. Gandhi, uh, um, both of them are asking about the mic's angle and they want to, uh, this is you to angle, show us yeah, this angle. Them again. It's called the mic's angle. Yeah. And the more you expose, the more of the long process you expose. So it's useful in middle ear, middle ear implants. Okay, so let's have the, the sickle, please. So that's the facial canal here, almost thin, not very thin bone on top of it. immediately behind the pyramid, okay. Burma, Give me a sickle. Oh, 
process. You can now see the course of the facial nerve, vertical part getting exposed. That's the facial nerve. I'm taking away all the perifacial cells. Remember, if you're using a diamond burr, it's very really close to the structures like this. Irrigation is very important, you know, because the diamond burr causes a lot, generates lot more heat, and you can cause thermal injury. And thermal injury to a nerve is much worse than mechanical injury. So you have to make sure that your irrigation is really, really good. We are reaching the digastric ridge there. Bigger bus, this diamond bus. And you can see the corda here. Corda is there. The facial is here. So, this is the corda facial angle now we are reaching. Can you please center it, sir, a uh, little bit? Is it centered now? Yes, sir. That's okay. So, sir, we are doctor. now reaching the tip there, and that's very close to the digastric ridge. And that's just going to be the stylum acid foramen there. So, you can see that the cord is originating here, a little higher, you know, that's the cord, the cord facial angle there. And that is the area where we are going to be, now is going to be exiting the phylum acid foramen region. And when it reaches the skull base, in fact, the facial nerve tends to get flattened out a bit more. And it starts, the perineurium will start blending with the periosteum of the skull base. So, it, you know, you can start getting more and more a flatter nerve. But you can always make out the nerve quite clearly. Sir, so Dr. Tengli from Kalbugi, uh, sir, so is the vertical facial is little bit post more posterior than usual in this case? No, no, it's exactly where it says, where I would expect it to be. Yeah? It's not more posterior. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, smaller diamond, please. Because we have thinned out the posterior canal quite a bit, you know, it looks like it is more posterior. Yes, sir. Okay? So, 
that's a god of fish language or So when you want to expose the sinus tympani here, you really want to go remove the bone anterior to the facial nerve. So this is lateral to the facial nerve. But also remove the bone in front of the facial nerve. Then only you expose the sinus tympani well. Okay, so that is the sinus symphony here. Give me a pointer. You have the round window niche here, hypotympanic cells coming up here. This is the sinus symphony area, right? Give me a peak, ma. Uh, sorry, sickly. So this is where the sinus symphony. Sometimes it can be very deep, okay? And then in that case, you really want to have a an endoscope to see that area. Now. The round window niche itself, you know, needs a little bit of attention. Give me a very fine uh, diamond and also a, a contrangle, please. So let's uh, expose the round window niche. And to do that, you have to take away the superior lip of the round window niche, what is known as the operculum or the lid. If you unroof it, then you will expose the round window membrane. Irrigation less. Irrigation, please. Fine suction. So now the membrane is coming into view. Give me a small pick. That is the round window niche op getting opened out and you can see the membrane now is slowly coming up. And generally, there is a little bit of in a normal uh, patient you would expect some fibrous tissue covering it. Here of course in a temporal bone you do not know, but you can now see that the round window membrane is getting exposed. That is the round window membrane. Okay. So, if you want to do a cochlear implant, of course, you would make an incision there uh, and to inferior part of it. The round window membrane or the secondary tympanic membrane is always perpendicular to the primary tympanic membrane. It is exactly 90 degrees to the primary tympanic membrane. So, you can, al you can almost draw a line with the compass. It is exactly 90 degrees. And uh, you know, you, you have to expose the, and the, the superior lip or the operculum covers it to a varying degree. And by doing so, it will, uh, you know, hide the tympanic membrane the, to varying degrees. Uh, sometimes it will be very right open, but sometimes it will be very deep. And unless you remove the operculum, you can't see it. But when you're removing the operculum, please take care not to damage the annulus of the secondary tympanic membrane. Within the, of course, the whole membrane will collapse. The second tympanic membrane does not have the same three layers as the primary tympanic membrane. It's much more flimsy. So, it won't be as taut as you are used to in a primary tympanic membrane. Okay. So, now we expose the facial nerve, vertical part, 
you gone up to the cellar, I said, for I am in there and you know, this is the digastric ridge, give me a physical. And if you see there, you can see that the digastric ridge from here and the, the facial nerve, vertical part, the digastric ridge and the sigmoid sinus is one continuous U, okay, it is like a garland, it is a beautiful garland. So, from here, sigmoid sinus, digastric ridge and the facial vertical part, all of them form a, a, a kind of a continuous U. And the horizontal part of the facial nerve is here, very easily you can remove the bone, very, very thin. In, in fact, for beginners, I would always advise if you are going to be exposing the entire horizontal part and the vertical part, remove the incus and then you know reposition it. Give me a small diamond. Here we are not doing it for a lot of time. So I am just going to take away this bone. Ah, come on. It is very thin bone, you know, so it must be feather light touch. See, when I go there, I can touch the incus, is it possible? So that's why I said remove the incus. Inadvertently, your bar may touch the incus, and that causes a tremendous amount of injury to the inner ear. Okay, give me a sickle, please. The horizontal part may be digestant in many patients or the bone if it is present is very, very thin bone you can just pick it up. So that's the horizontal part now. That's the pyramid here. The nerve goes immediately behind the pyramid, posterior relationship to it, and that's the process cochlearium is where it ends. And then of course it takes a turn that we'll see tomorrow. So that's the entire horizontal and the vertical part up to the cellular mass for a little bit more here. That's the quadrifacial angle, and you can see the facial nerve uh, here in all its glory and of course your nerve to stapedius will be just there you know. So to see the nerve stapedius you have to lift up the nerve from the canal. Along with the sheath of the nerve. But remember, the moment you lift the nerve out of its canal, you are devascularizing the nerve. So, you will have a, a grade 3 or, you know, usually a grade 3 palsy, which is temporary of course, usually, but you will produce a palsy. The very fact that you are lifting the nerve from its canal will cause a grade 3 palsy. But if you want to just want for the sake of demonstration here, I am just lifting it up and then you can see the 
nerve to step edis that there it is that's the uh, sir doctor that's the doctor kartike sir doctor kartike from uh, coimbatore is uh, asking uh, uh, very happy to uh, see this during this lockdown and uh, he wants and many are asking about to show the subiculum and ponticulus anatomy again ah, sir okay Dr. Divya from Kolkata. She is also asking the same. Ponticulus is sorry from the pyramid. I should show you earlier on pyramid to the promontory. That's ponticulus. Okay, and subiculum goes to the hypotympanum. From the pyramid, it goes down. So between the two, the the, the this is the uh, it's already fractured here. But the the ponticulus is a short process. Sometimes very prominent in some bones between the pyramid and the promontory. So it is. It will be seen like a ridge. And the uh, subiculum goes to the hypotympanum. Between the two, of course, is the the space of the uh, you know the sinus tympanum. Uh, not always prominent in all the bones, but in some bones it will be very well seen. But in, I don't think there's any great see. I don't know why we make so much of a fuss about it, you know, honestly. But if the sometimes the ponticulus is very prominent, then you may have to drill it a bit so to get exposure. The cholestoma may be lurking there. But all these are pre-endoscopic era. You know, once the endoscope has come in. all these are meaningless uh, terms really okay so i think i'm going to stop there actually because i think the next exercise uh, of canal wall down and all that we'll reserve till we show a little bit more uh, next year next uh, this section we're going to show the inner ear anatomy cochlea and all that then we can uh, take the canal wall down it will be next sunday 10 o'clock i think so we'll meet then but uh, we had a wonderful session i think i've exceeded my time i've been getting warnings from uh, vijay so i know i'm i'm gone well past my time but let me know.